Hey everybody, it has been a while, and before we start today's episode, I would like to thank you guys for all the kind words you gave me on the update I did on Star Wars Factions and why I took a break for so long. I was really moved by the support and kind words you guys left in the comments. I'm sure some of you who left comments did not think that the break would last a half year, but I just needed to concentrate on some other series and inspiration, as working on the same series over and over and over again were one episode that lasts 25 minutes, takes over 30 hours to make, can really drain one's spirit. Now the plot and story was already set in stone before I took the break, so story-wise nothing has changed. As I said in the update video, I will now stick to the 10 minute format though, as that makes it to where making an episode is manageable. The first parts of episode 32 have already been filmed, so don't worry about having to wait too long for the next episode. Now, it's been far too long since we heard that magical intro. Previously on Star Wars Factions. Among certain members of the Jedi Council, more and more support increases for the so-called JS-13 plan, even though most of those who support it don't even know what it exactly stands for, just that the Council has absolutely forbidden the use of it. This has Yoda and the most elite of Jedi worried. At the same time, the Zahn Consortium and the CIS had made a deal. Zan demanded two trading routes to be left alone by the fabricated pirate wars, and in return, Silri would travel to Coruscant to retrieve the data concerning the location of the main cloning facility on Kamino. Before she could do this, she would first need to travel to the depths of Coruscant in search for a rancor bigger than anyone had ever seen in order to create a distraction. Coruscant Though the upper levels and outlook towards the galaxy might be a pristine and glorious center of a strong republic, for its inhabitants, Coruscant meant something different to each individual. To some, it was a planet of vice, creating opportunities to get rich fast. But the money was always dirty. The lower you went, the dirtier the money. For others, it was the perfect place to disappear, with so many nooks and crannies and the corrupt police, of course, at one side. There were those who saw Coruscant as an architectural marble, ever pushing the capabilities of combined species across the galaxy. For a few, it was purgatory, an everlasting weight down one's back and a harsh reality that nothing would ever change. For a few who felt enlightened and wanted to learn about the Force, Coruscant gave opportunity in the form of various Jedi Academies to seek out those worthy to become a Jedi Knight and practice politics and as advisors to the people. Besides studying politics and the ways of the Force, lightsaber training was also rigorous in their holo rooms where many met their match. And for those trying their luck, Coruscant also had plenty to offer in the form of gambling, whether it be an innocent card game or real high stakes like the illegal gladiatorial matches. Audience attendance was always high, as matches varied from one-to-one -one duels to all-out battle royales with one man left standing. Some of these were sometimes visited by a few politicians, even a few who were part of the Jedi higher-ups. Discretion was of the utmost importance to the organizers, and thus, Cameras or audio trackers could not hinder open talk and debate. It was here 
where two politicians talked about a Night Sister visiting the city soon in the name of the Zan Consortium, but ultimately doing a job for the CIS. Takaso Koma, a conservative who made a name for himself for his open hatred for the CIS, had come to understand that information would be passed on to the CIS by Zan. As a result, the CIS could make a move. Sokoma saw this as a chance to advocate the use of JS-13, the topic that had come to rise amongst the Jedi Order on multiple occasions, but was always silenced as quickly as possible. Sokoma told his adversary to leave some of the landing stations less attended than usual. That would make it easier for the guests to make their way into Coruscant. Yes, Coruscant was many things. But for Russell Mulder, Chief Detective of District 21B, Coruscant was a cancerous parade of the worst the galaxy had to offer. Through his many years of service, he had seen it all, witnessed what sentient living beings were able to do to one another. Men, women, children, not even infants were spared like that one case six years ago. And often the deaths were not clean. A quick blaster shot would make too much noise. In the Coruscant on the ground, poison and sharp objects were the preferred method. Mulder had seen a lot of cop rookies break under the pressure and horrifying imagery that one is being presented. He knew how the system worked. Justice was often far from these cases. The cops appointed to them usually hoped that the criminal had fled to another district or planet, making it another chief's problem. Mahler was different. Though he was in no way an established heroic figure, in fact, far from it, often feeling unmotivated in the beginning to start a case and instead reaching for the bottle, the thought of some thug getting away with crude murder was something he could not stomach. He would have liked his district to stand out amongst others as the one district protected by the selfless vigilante, the one detective always catching the bad guys. But this was also far from the truth, as more often than not, the cases led to a dead trail or more dead bodies. Three, three times Mulder had to kill someone in self-defense. They were all the suspect in question. He wished it made him feel better to rid the world of someone like that, but it did not. He firmly believed in the justice system, because though the corrupt cops were easily persuaded in Lower Coruscant, the prisons and detention centers were an entirely different story. On the next morning, Mulder received a call. Two people went missing in his district. Of course, he thought. Russell lost his previous two partners both during the investigation of a case, making Russell to prefer working alone. Now that did not mean he was entirely on his own. The call came from his chief assistant, Crone. On the way out, Mulder asked for details on the disappearance. It concerned two individuals, both male, and they were known as Velos Fletcher and Byron Stamp. They had been missing for three days after last been seen at a local bar in the evening. Mulder asked for the addresses of both missing persons and said he himself would take a look at Fletcher's apartment. He ordered Crone to check out Stem's living area and then meet up later to exchange details. Crone confirmed and Mulder headed towards Fletcher's living area by a cab. At the edge of his district, Silri had arrived with a crew of defilers. When she noticed no heavy security, she was surprised and emerged alone from her vessel. The officers at the location were rookies, still wet behind the ears and did not realize that the person standing before them was well known by certain groups. They demanded Silri to identify herself and tell them the purpose of her visit. She refrained from answering. She could see that these were inexperienced as they were stammering and undecisive about what to do next. Silri ran out of patience and with a hand sign, her troops ran out of the ship as well. The three policemen were so surprised by this that they could not even speak a word. But it was already too late as before they came back to their senses, their bodies had already hit the ground. Though the lack of security was done in the favor of Silri's mission, it left her uneasy to know that there might be insiders who were aware of the mission or deal that was made. She altered her plan and ordered her defilers to follow her to a different district not too far from there. 
Once Mulder arrived at Fletcher's living place, he decided to take a look around. The area seemed ordinary. Nothing particularly strange about it. It was clear it had not been visited during the last three days since he had gone missing. Fletcher did not seem rich. It was clear that Fletcher gone missing had nothing to do with his particular wealth or physical property. Mulder soon spotted an old man on the street. He reached out towards the man. It turned out the old man was Fletcher's neighbor. From asking the man questions, it became clear to Mulder that the missing of Fletcher had gone unnoticed by the man. He confirmed with the man that though their relationship was not bad, it did not linger towards anything but greeting each other whenever their paths would cross. But the old man did recall that he saw Fletcher and Stemp leave the apartment on the evening they went missing. And, he followed up, they were accompanied by a Rodian. Mulder asked a neighbor to describe the Rodian. Though his physical description was quite vague, what gave it away was the description of the clothing. The Rodian apparently was wearing a bright green vest with gold accents. Mulder already knew by then that this was the Rodian Zeke. Zeke was the type of Rodian who wanted to believe he was a master criminal, but he did not have the guts for it. He probably would be too scared to kill someone if he was given the chance. It was unlikely that he was the reason behind Fletcher gone missing, but nevertheless Mulder thanked a man and called Crone to tell him the news. Crone had found nothing suspicious as well. At least they had the clue of Zeke now to go by. He knew the streets that Zeke usually hung out on, so Mulder told Crone to meet him over there. Mulder also issued that Shiraya, a female Twi'lek who joined their team just two months ago, accompanied them to Zeke as well. Silri had not descended into the depths of Coruscant yet in search of the Rancor. Instead, she wanted to disappear in the crowds by stealing clone uniforms. No one would ask questions if they saw a bunch of clones roam the streets as the Republic was in control of the whole planet. But the Coruscant Guard would be too high profile and chances were higher that missing equipment or sightings would be called in. Silri found a small supply point protected by a bunch of regular clones. A perfect opportunity for her defilers. They had to be quick. If a disturbance was reported to the clones higher ups, right then and there, Silri's cover would be blown. If they could take them out quick enough, eventually the clones would find out that something was amiss, but by that time, Silri and her men would be long gone. She gave the order and the defilers opened fire. The clones did not stand around like the police officers did, but were surprised and quickly overwhelmed. A few were shot down immediately, and as another was running for cover to call in help, he was shot too. The final clone panicked and reported in to his superiors, but before he could utter the words, he was shot and killed. Silri could hear the officer at the other end asking questions and confirming that reinforcements were on their way. She realized she was out of time and ordered the defiler to change quickly as they needed to leave as soon as possible. And thus, Silri headed on over to the nearest entrance to bring her and her newly acquired clone comrades to the depths of Coruscant.